Oh, hello there. Welcome to Process Pod number 27. With me, Sal Good Sam. I've tried to record these a few times this week. Tends to go off the rails. There's a lot going on. It's hard to keep my head sorted. Um, I posted a, an official statement on Patreon about what I think of the whole Cameron Stewart and Warren Ellis thing. Um, more stories have come out since then. I'm not totally surprised. I've had the, the privilege of growing up in a very progressive feminist household, so it wasn't news to me this sort of stuff happened in the world. I think the first time I, I knew it happened in comics, it was in my first couple of years working in the industry, and I was uh, at a show as a professional, and I got, got away from my table to attend a Women in Comics panel. And I, I remember a bunch of people who could have been on it, but I'm not sure who the panel attendees are. I'm pretty sure Gail Simone and Colleen Duran were on it. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Colleen Duran was asked about the applicant, a story Dave Sim did about a run-in she had uh, with an older editor that was published in the late 80s. And um, it went from there. They started talking about a whole bunch of people, stopped short of naming names, but um, sharing different experiences they'd all had as women in the industry. And I remember thinking in the audience, oh, of course, it happens in comics too. Um, there have been repeated outings, uh, and some of the people getting talked about this week are people who we've known about for a while. Um, Charles, um, uh, what's his face from the Comic Legal Defense Fund? What's his face is appropriate at the moment. Um, it was 14 years ago that came out. Uh, I, back then I didn't know the all the details. I think by the time I did, it was a year after. I caught word of it in message boards or shortly after it happened uh, with Taki. Uh, and then a year later saw the a couple of news stories that came out uh, summarizing those events. And, you know, famously Colleen made a statement back then, but she's since walked her back and apologized because she, uh, she said she was a bit misled by some folks, uh, which is understandable because people are eager to try to gaslight and distract and so doubt and delay uh, and generally get people to think about something else for a while uh, a favorite Trump tactic uh, change the subject and so it still happens and so this last week a whole bunch of people have come out and people keep talking about it feeling different that would be cool if it's different if it really doesn't get eventually just where and maybe there's incremental change, but nothing su substantial. That has been the past. Um, but maybe it won't be that, and I'm hopeful. I was neat to see Kelly Sue DeCormick, DeCormick? DeCormick, uh, come out and make a statement that I very much agree with. So aside from uh, sharing in her sense of, I think for her, much more profound, because she was actually working directly with Warren and knew him. Um, but even just by being a part of that community and not seeing, I, I kind of even sort of saw it. I'll leave it to the statement on Patreon to get into the details. But, but feeling like I had indirectly somehow contributed it was definitely communal culpability in situations like that. And uh, I agreed with her assessment that a primary short-term thing that can be addressed that would help greatly mitigate the vulnerability that is exposed by these stories is a return to something resembling a professionalized system of access to the industry for people who want to get into the direct market comics industry. And so to be, to be clear, the well, it's not impossible for there to be stories about misconduct in other parts of the business. Um, the recent growth in publishing graphic novels through book publishers, we're not hearing about stories that particularly plague that area. We're not hearing about stories that particularly plague um, uh, the European BD market. I'm sure they, some exist, but they have more professionalized avenues with agents and HR departments and uh, less casual means of acquiring talent. Um, when I started out, so 1990s, late 80s, um, and this is how I got my first jobs. You would create a portfolio of your work. I just made used photocopier, 
the late by eight f by eleven booklet. Um, color cardstock for the cover with my contact information. This is before email even. It was a fax number and a phone number. It's actually the same number. Um, and my address. And then in my best pages. I had done a black and white independent black and white boom book. I got the tail end of the black and white boom and did a book with Caliber Press. So I had some pages from that. I did some sample pages of characters that I was interested in at DC. This is before Vertigo, but they were all titles that became Vertigo titles. Most of my portfolios went to DC editors. And then a uh, one, I went sent one to Bobby Chase at Marvel because I was interested in the epic and horror lines that they did. But I didn't really have a good read on the editors there. I didn't read those books as often, whereas I followed several DC books closely and, and knew the horror line well um, at that point. And I got I was asked to do tests by Karen Berger and Stuart Moore. I did two, and midway through the second one, I got contacted by Malcolm McLaurin at Marvel based on my work that had fallen on his desk just as he had an artist abandon a book. And he said, hey, we got a book that's half finished. We need someone quick. You want to give it a shot? And that was my job. That was my first job. I was finishing off, uh, I won't even say, uh, infamous characters become, become infamous in the comic industry. And I, I picked up his, his uh, loose pieces and wrapped up a book and got another book and then got a, a, a monthly book. That didn't work out great, but all to say there was a fairly... Uh, professionalized application process. I didn't have to schmooze editors at parties. I had been showing people at conventions my stuff in public at tables and big lineups uh, and getting reads on whether my work was there yet. And I had the had become bold enough to try this because I had done a show where Carl Potts and um, a couple of artists, I want to say, so Ty Teppen was there too. But also, um, and he'd been a mentor, and I think he was rooting for me, so he's post, but he, he peep, peep, peeped up, peeped up a couple times to cheer on. Um, but my stuff got passed around. It was actually me and a couple of friends of mine. We were, I'd, I'd dropped out of high school by then, but I'd gone to an arts high school, and a bunch of my friends at that high school were also into comics. And, the, and we all got together at a convention and showed these editors our work. And we'd all gotten really great feedback and had her stuff passed around between these artists and editors and I'd gotten a card from Carl Potts he said you know stay in touch uh, so I'd gone on to do a black and white book of my own and when that I didn't walk away from it having a different opinion ironically not so ironically coincidentally uh, about the writer wanting to do something grotesquely graphic uh, and needlessly violent without appropriate dramatic context I felt uh, to a character I liked um, and I didn't want to draw it and so the book died I was Nature of the Beast you can see the first two issues on my website um, I talked about it recently in a video and uh, at that point I said well I'm going to give this a try I'm sick of making sandwiches and washing dishes um, so I put together a portfolio and sent it and that was it I didn't have to like hang out at the bar after shows with people and become their best buddies and get read in that way but that's the way the industry's evolved and that's created a situation where people primarily seek to get in because they're told that's the way you get in i've done it myself i said you want to get in it's, it ultimately comes down to you got to know people you got to have someone inside and that's because uh, over a couple of decades ago marvel and dc stopped accepting portfolios at the door they stop t t taking submissions, and they don't keep an HR department. Uh, I don't think they ever really had an HR department, but they had Marvel had the bullpen, which was sort of an in-house staff thing, and that must have had some sort of management. And uh, yeah, now that they're owned by Disney and Time Warner, hopefully the parent companies who understand liability better will crack the whip and actually make them re-professionalize the application process. Contests and networking at bars after conventions is not even close to being the optimal way. You might be fun, but it creates a vulnerable situation for a lot of people, and we're seeing the fruits of that. Um, some of this stuff was seeded long before Marvel DC stopped taking portfolios even, but it was moving in that direction already when it started. 
Uh, that was part of the problem. There was an increasingly less interest in looking at new talent that way. Um, you need to do the work. I'm sorry if it costs money to run the department. Suck it up. Um, if you want to stay in the business. And maybe you need to look at how that works. There's a lot of other reasons why the direct market comics industry is having problems right now. And the model has never been, under the current situations, ideal. Um, even less so now with COVID, but that's going to pass. Uh, I'm not a fan of monthly books. I think pamphlets don't have to like go away forever, but as the primary mainstay of the industry, it's highly questionable. Um, I think more investment in time and talent and substance over epic schedules and franchise development even a little bit would be an improvement, a direction that needs to be moved in. And that includes better uh, better investment in, in, in standards and ethics and creating a system in which it isn't so easy for someone to use their power over a young applicant. Be them man or woman queer or straight doesn't matter I think that's probably a good place to leave that yes so yeah when it comes to the guys being gropey go check out my patreon statement I'll put it in the description text I wanted to point out as well I saw a cool YouTube channel that started up he's still working out the bugs and stuff but I nodded in emphatic agreement with a video above his, so Comic Book Noise, spelled N-O-I-X-E, and he did a kind of clickbaity headline that I saw on a Facebook forum, when social justice warriors go wrong, but he's actually like, he's very pro social justice. He wanted to comment on, you know, one of the few things that the gamer, not gamer, comic gate crowd gets right. It's, this is the true with all of these things, you know, a broken clock once a day, but the, a lot of these uh, movements, groups, loosely speaking, um, they recognize one problem, uh, but then mis misassign guilt and culpability and, and, and cause. So it's true that the main two big companies, a lot of the comics direct market industry, which the comic gate people always seem to talk about like it's the only industry. It's not biggest industry right now is children's comics and that's followed by some very healthy literary comics uh, sales and European comics industry and the manga market and these are all comics and there's it's not just American direct market guys but in the American direct market um, the the main two and many others have tried to become more progressive and representational in their efforts and I think there are individuals who are involved in that in those companies who are genuine and earnest in their desire. And there are people who are doing it because they think the marketing gurus say it's the right idea. And both parties could be guilty of executing that badly. Um, just because you come from a good place doesn't mean you get it right. Uh, the story that he specifically talked about let me see if I can start this without starting this. There we go. Uh, what was the what was again the the book? Oh, I don't know. Was it like New Warriors? Is it the new New Warriors? So it's basically the two characters that they came up with, which I had to agree were just embarrassingly laughable. Yes, New Warriors. Uh, Snowflake and Safe Space. Really, guys? Really? That's the best you could do? Did you run that by any people of color or queer individuals by chance before running with it? I mean, who are you making fun of? Was it? Were you trying to have it both ways? Were you trying to make fun of both uh, social justice advocates, advocates but and then give them a character that they would identify with? Is that it? 
but like this isn't this isn't the problem isn't that the industry is pandering uh the problem that definitely was pandering but it was pandering because it had the pretense of attempting to try to have representation and address these things but failed in execution and you know the only truth to the concept of pretension being bad is when it fails to meet the mark if you i if you if you go into something with any pretension of trying to do something good and in this case have representation there's nothing wrong with that but it's important to get it right or at least not get it wrong so badly um and there are ways of avoiding getting it wrong so badly that definitely could have been test audience against somebody who would go mm, 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 mm. don't do that no um and listen to them when they say that i've been the person who stepped up and go hey you know guys that was my experience most of the time early on at marvel hey you know that thing that's like really she's gonna go to another country to get stoned by all of her possessions being piled upon her because she had an affair with a westerner but her handmaidens can hang out at the cafe across the street and let morbius know about this candidly via a a, a, a waitress it's like sexist and weird and kind of racist but also just not plausible it's bad this was a morbius book that i refused to draw in the end um yeah and then i got laughed you got laughed off or in that case you know, it was yeah it's more complicated but um definitely there were many situations i had where i raised such concerns and were like you don't know what you're talking about kid was the response i got no <laughs> anyway Sensitivity readers, something like that. I don't know. Um, definitely, what was his name? Daniel Keeblesmith. Keebler Smith? It's tiny writing on the screen right now. Sorry, let me get that bigger. Kibblesmith. Daniel Kibblesmith. I don't mean to be rude, but I've never heard of him. Uh, the writer. Someone needed to talk to Daniel about that. The, the concept of this, these new warrior characters feels possibly earnest, but an execution very pandery. And uh, avoidable. Um, making good comics is hard. So I don't, I'm not going to like come at anyone with knives drawn for kind of flubbing it and doing something cornball. But when you mix it up with trying to be progressive and socially conscious, it can get very embarrassing. Uh, you need to do do better at that. Um, you know, as long as that professional hiring process, you might want to uh, work on your editors a little. And I don't have a problem with publishers if they want to speak to readers from a more diverse background and want to open up readership to younger and more... Uh, diverse readerships it's a good idea but if you do it badly it's gonna suck and that has been too often the problem and to be completely blunt that wasn't didn't start when you tried to be you know pander to progressive ideas um it's like an old truism 99 percent of everything sucks so that's can be true and you see that in the book market but there are a few common methods process oriented methods of, of trying to avoid that and the simplest one is take more time the monthly schedule kind of commercial market just pump them out as fast as you can as many as you can keep them hooked keep them Warren Ellis used to talk about us all the time and I fucking hated it this sort of addiction oriented uh, dealer attitude towards the consumable uh, light fiction of comic books sure it can work economically but it's very exploitive and and people's tolerance and attention spans are actually not infinite resources if you keep feeding them bullshit and short-term stories that just you know cancel out and there's a flashpoint or some sort of crisis or a war of the worlds or what ever have you and you write it start all over from scratch again and don't bring anything new to the table or and when you do it's either pandering or derivative 
you set up a board, and maybe if you had a more professionalized uh, talent scouting system, you could bring in more talent with ideas, and if you let them own a little piece of that maybe, or just have a more investment in the process and more time and room to breathe, develop the work, and not churn it out on a monthly basis, and editors could look at it and go, hmm, and not worried about meeting a deadline so much as crafting the work with lots of room, like a year in the deadline to put out a book so that they could say to their writers, I think this is interesting, but I think you could do better here. And what about this idea? And all the things that I never encountered as a professional working in Marvel. It was only ever deadlines. Deadlines and uh, revisions based on technical issues that came up and scheduling and deadlines and uh, occasionally conversations about what we imagined for this story or this book or this project, but that all seemed to go out the window once the project actually started. And we get notes. Uh, Elaine Lee got notes from Mark all the time to get rid of all of the character development scenes and have more action. Or at least it happened once. I don't remember if it was all the time. We won't, I was only in the book for four or five issues. So, uh, But I know that that was a common thing for writers who wanted to try to develop more complex stories. And Marvel art editors had this idea of they could do what DC was doing better, and then they would put out thin crap to try to compete with what Vertigo was doing, which wasn't even always a brilliant, but it was at least trying to be more literary and trying to spend more time developing stories. I know that the DC Vertigo editorial policy was definitely more actually editing to a degree. There was still a lot of project management, but that's a thing that's that's been neglected and has become stunted in the American direct market. Uh, actual constructive editorial input and the time to allow for it which is next to impossible with monthly books no matter how much lead time you build in because you created a cycle that has to be maintained it's an engine and every time there's a, a deadline hiccup you're you're wearing away at your ablative armor that's the way that's the model it's an ablative armor model you don't need an ablative armor model you don't need a a, a drug keeping them hooked model you need Develop substantive content, make art, because good art, good writing, ultimately in the long run sells better than disposable consumable crap. Sure, it looks good in a ledger in the short term, but it doesn't have legs long term. And uh, that's my pet theory. I don't know about you. Well, it's 20 minutes, and I think I've been reasonably focused this time. Oh, should I say all the things in the sign-off? Yes, I will. It should not need to be said, but while all lives might matter, the conversation's about black lives mattering right now. Uh, and if all lives do matter, then you agree black lives matter. You agree, right? You you understand that. Um, I know that they're not a monolith, but fuck the police. This... Uh, defund, disband if necessary, if the particular precinct is corrupt to the bone, deal with the problems, stop militarizing them, and train them to be peacekeepers, not institutional soldiers for authoritarian governments, because that's what they become. Um, Canada is not especially less racist. We just tend to focus more on racism with a smile when it comes to immigrants and just a lot of shit treatment when it comes to First Nations. Straight up blatant abuse, murdering, depriving. Uh, we need to deal with that shit. And so far, yay us for not being nearly as bad as the guys down south when it comes to COVID. But wash your fucking hands. Wear a goddamn mask. You know, the stats you see on some of those infographics, they're a little fudged. Because no one's done enough research now to tell you for sure that only 1.5% of stuff is communicated if both parties wear a mask. But what we have done so far, while maybe not backed up by very specific stats, does show that if everyone is wearing a mask, contact uh, with airborne virus drops to near nil. There was a story about um, a, a beauty salon that opened up for... A, f a few days or a week or something like that and they made all the clients wear masks and the hairstylists wore masks and it turned out the hairstylist actually had COVID but no one caught it because masks and it turns out contact 
contagion, surface contacts, and touching, not nearly as much a problem. You, you've got to get those goodies that you sneeze out and breathe out. Those are the things. And if you're wearing a mask, they don't come out of you. And you don't know if you've got it, so you wear it. And everyone wears it. And no one's coming out. It's not in the air. And, oh, look at that. You don't have to worry about if the mask you're wearing is all that good for keeping it out. Because as long as it keeps it in, that's what counts. And if everyone keeps it in, we can all get back to our lives and wash our hands and try to treat each other like human beings a bit more. Cheers.